Hello and welcome to Gabbit Media. I'm Grant Abbott and today we're on part 10 of Get Good at Blender. Still focusing on hard surface modeling and topology and just developing our modeling skills in general. So today we'll be working through making some steampunk goggles and I would just encourage you to look at the image in front of you and see if you can have a go without any guidance at all. Otherwise I'll be breaking the model down into sections and giving you challenges along the way. I would say we're getting onto a more intermediate level at the moment, so do make sure you've looked at my beginner tutorials and the previous exercises in this playlist. It's not absolutely vital, but if you're finding it tough, then have a look at those. Also, if you want a more detailed, in-depth beginner course, then the course from CG Boost is what I would recommend. All these links and playlists are in the description. So if you hadn't figured out already, I've separated this into different sections, as you can see here. And the first section we're going to do is this piece here. So see how you get on with that. So hopefully that's not too difficult. The only tough part is the slope at the back, I would say. So with my cursor in the center, shift A to add, and let's add a cylinder. Now I'm going to add a subdivision surface modifier, so it's best to keep the vertices down a bit lower than the default, which is 32. I still like to have it divisible by four in case I want to mirror in both directions. So I've got it at 12. So let's zoom into our object with period key on the numpad and into edit mode. So I'll just model from the top here and rotate it afterwards. And we can see that the top bit needs scaling down. So getting your basic shape is all important to start off with. And as I said before, we need to change the back part so it slopes upwards like this. Probably the easiest way, go into vertex mode. And I'm choosing vertex mode so I can grab that one that's on one of the axis in case I want to mirror later on. Into front view, O to go to proportional edit, and that tool is up here. You can change the different types of fall off as it's known. I've gone for inverse squared. So when we press G to grab and we get that big circle, it's how much it's going to influence towards the outside of the circle is the fall off. So I can bring this up a bit. It's quite tricky. If I bring it up too much, then I'll start affecting the top. So probably about there where I'm affecting most of the bottom, but not touching the top. And about that height is absolutely fine. Now these sort of steampunk goggles do follow the shape of the face slightly. So they come in a bit more here and then round. So I can grab this middle one, G, then Z. And unfortunately, I'm not affecting the back one. Now, maybe this is a good time for mirroring. Having said that, it's kind of handy to keep it in a cylinder without mirroring. Then we can inset and all sorts later on. So I'll grab the back one as well, and then go to side view, G to grab, make my circle of influence a little bit smaller, and Z to grab in the Z axis. Now we're going to get this anomaly in the middle there, where the face is trying to cover all these different points and as you can see, it warps slightly. But we don't really need to worry about that at the moment because we're not really going to keep this face. So we might as well delete it now and delete the top one. And just have a look and make sure you're happy with the way it curves. Now the proportional edit isn't perfect, so I'm going to turn it off with O and just grab this vertex in the Z axis just slightly so there's more of a precise curve. And maybe these two, G then Z, just to give it a nicer curve in my opinion. Remember to hold down shift if you want only slight increments. So I've refined my curve slightly to make sure I'm happy with it. Now let's select this bottom edge and then we can extrude in the Z. So now we've got this section here. So now in face mode with three on my numpad, I can select this face loop here. Remember to select a face loop, you select the edge that's going across the loop that you want. I can extrude this out and scale. But remember, when you're scaling like this, it's going to scale in the Z axis as well. I can press Shift Z to get rid of that. And that way we won't scale in the Z axis. We'll keep the height of our faces. Somewhere around there should be fine. I'll sort out the bottom part a bit later. Let's do the top part first. So I'll select these edge loops. Now the slightly different way we can do this is extrude and scale straight away. And then extrude upwards in the Z axis, which is pretty much the same thing. And extrude and scale until we're happy. Now just make sure you've got them at the same height. You may need to select an edge loop at the bottom, let's say. If we look at this, these are a bit thicker than these ones. So I can just grab these in the Z axis slightly to make them a similar size. Somewhere around there anyway. Now I'm not going to fill these areas in just yet because I'm going to separate these objects out 
It seems obvious to separate objects out, especially if they've got a completely different material. The reason I'm creating them together is so that they follow the same curve around. Now we can see I've got some sort of curvy bit around here as well. So it should be easy enough to create that with Control R, but we've got a problem. When I left click and I move my edge up and down, I want it to follow the evenness of the top. So be flat like this in the Z axis, but as I move down, it follows the curve and averages out the distance between these two edges that I'm looping between. And if I were to, let's say, set this around here and then go scale Z zero, we can see it distorts my shape. So let's undo that. If I press control R and then left click to say, yes, I want one edge loop. Now, if I press E, can you see where the red dot is? It's saying it's using that edge at the bottom and it's keeping that shape and that alignment. If I press F now to flip, it keeps the top and we want it somewhere around there. So E and F. You can find these tools down here as well, even and flipped. But remember, you've got to press left click to say you want one edge loop first, and then you can use those controls. E then F. So now if I press control B, I can bevel this. Let's keep it relatively simple with two loop cuts in the middle there. Select that edge loop going around the middle and scale it up. And there we have our basic shape. Now we'll need to do some adjustments because we want to add the subdivision surface modifier. So under the spanner, up to modifiers, subdivision surface. And we can see it goes that sort of blobby shape. First of all, let's right click and shade smooth. And we just need to sharpen some edges up. I'll put the viewport display up one first. So we're the same as the render. And in this case, there's no need to go higher than two. And let's have a closer look in edit mode. We need to sharpen some edges up. So this one, sorry, in edge mode with two, this one and this one certainly need to be sharpened. So press N on your keyboard and there's the mean crease. And I like to use the mean crease when I can. It's not always that simple, especially when your crease goes through any poles. But if it's a nice, simple circle like this, the mean crease is your best tool, in my opinion. So let's crease these two as well. Step back, see what we've got. Probably gone a bit too sharp on these, but I'll do the other ones for now. It's tricky to select these. Sometimes you need to go onto the cage option with the subdivision surface modifier to select those edges. And then we can start mean creasing that and generally doing a bit of tidy up. Now, actually, I don't really need to crease this one because when I separate this object, it will form a crease down there naturally anyway. So now seems like a good time to do that. Let's turn the cage off. And in fact, I'll turn the subdivision surface modifier off just so it's a bit easier. There's a couple of ways of separating them. First of all, I could select this edge loop and then press Control plus to grow that selection. And now I've got everything I need selected and press P to separate by selection. And now that's a separate object. Or if I go to the top one here, I can select this edge loop here and press V and that splits the vertices up. So if I left click now, I've actually got two vertices on top of each other all the way around. Hence why it looks a bit peculiar with the shading. Now you cannot do this if you've got the active tools and options auto merge on because as soon as you left click, they're right on top of each other. So they'll merge together again. So just watch out for that. But now if I, press P and then by loose parts, this will become a separate object because it is actually separate. The vertices have been split in here. So I can now view my subdivision surface modifiers again, and you can see that they all nicely fit together. The last thing I need to do is just tidy up and merge these insides. So select the top edge and the bottom edge with Alt, Shift, left click, and Control E, bridge edge loops. Now you'll probably want to sort out the sharpness of your edge creases in here as well, and maybe scale up that inside loop. But I'll leave you to do those things. So the same thing here, just to tidy up, select the bottom edge loop with Alt left click, and also this edge loop with Shift Alt left click, and Control E bridge edge loops. And there we have it. So hopefully that all makes sense. The next shape for you to model is this one here. A couple of hints here. You probably will want to use the mirror, certainly, but also think about your starting point and how can we make this cut in here match up with this part of our goggles. So have a go at that. Okay, so for this one, again, I'm not going to worry too much about the rotation and which way it's pointing. I'm just going to model it to line up with this one. Now, the easiest way, in my opinion, to get this shape to match up with this one is to actually use the circle of this shape. So if I go into edit mode now, and just quickly think about whereabouts it's sitting on our goggles. So just underneath this curve. So if I press Control R to do a loop cut, 
and we can practice our skills on this again, can't we? E for even, F for flipped, and it wants to be about this sort of height. And another one underneath it, so Control R, left click, E for even, F for flipped, and it's gonna be about this sort of thickness. Now I can select these faces here, Shift D to duplicate, and press Enter, and P to separate by selection. Now I have a separate model that's the right size and fitted nicely to the other one. And you can see it fits nicely because you're getting this strange distortion because there's faces on top of each other. So now we can come out of edit mode, select our new shape into edit mode and start doing our editing. And from here, I believe the rest of it should be fairly easy for most people to cope with. Let's select all, extrude, scale, shift Z so we don't scale in the Z axis and bring our shape out slightly. We can select these two faces here and extrude them out in the x-axis. I'll scale those in the x-axis zero so they align and I can delete these faces and I need to bring my pivot point to the end here to mirror it. So if I press one to go to vertex mode and select these two and then press shift S, cursor to selected, the cursor is going to go right in the middle there. Now when I go into object mode, I can right click and set origin to 3D cursor. Now the origin is in place for my mirror. So let's go across and add our mirror. And there it is on the other side. Now there's probably a fair bit you'll want to do in terms of sharpening the edges up. So into edge mode, select the edges you want to sharpen and across to the mean crease. Now this is a useful one because it highlights and illustrates the point I was trying to make. We have a pole here. So the edge loop obviously doesn't go through the pole when I select it, so I select different edge loops here. They don't go through poles. So I'll need to select this one and maybe add a crease here. But we're probably going to get a tiny bit of pinching around the pole. And that's why it can be a bit tricky using that crease tool at times, especially when you're going through poles. In this case, it's not too bad, so we can leave it like that. And you can actually have a different mean crease here to this one here. So you might want this one sharper as it turns into a smoother one there. Now you'll see my goggles have a slight bend to them. And I slightly cheated with this, I suppose. With my 3D cursor in place, I'm going to turn the mirror off. So I in fact, just delete the mirror for now. I'm going to go to front view and I'm going to rotate this slightly. So R and then 10, for example. In fact, minus 10, so it curves the right way. Then I can grab this one, this one, and this one. And with the 3D cursor, as my transform pivot point, I can then press R, minus 10, and it will curve in exactly the same position. Now I can select this and just align my edges here. So select these, scale in the X zero, and then put my mirror on. Now it's not creating a curve because I need to set the rotation in this position. So I can go into object mode, control A and set the rotation and it will go with this curve. Now all I need to do is to control R here and grab in the Z axis to create a slight curve across there. And that's the easiest way in my opinion. Now if you want to copy this across to the other side and have it exact, you could actually select these and set their scale. But before you do that, make sure you're happy with all the model because once you've set the scale in an awkward position like this, it can start making the rest of the modeling process a little bit tougher. So there's one thing I'd like to do before doing it, and that is the piece of glass that goes around here. Now have a think for a moment about how you can create that and maybe have a go at creating that yourself. Okay, so it follows the same procedure as I did before. Let's select this top kind of torus here. Now I've already got that loop selected and I can press Shift D to duplicate. I'll press full stop so I zoom in. And now I want to press P to separate the selection or by loose parts. It is a loose part at the moment, but selection because it's selected. Into object mode and select that new circle that I've got. It's got a subdivision surface modifier on it. So it's following the curve quite nicely. And we may want to scale it up so it digs into this. It does depend if I select this on how sharp your edge is down here as to how much you want to dig it in. You may want to move it up slightly as well so it digs into this surface or sits underneath it, it's all up to you. But let's go back to that object and then think about how we fill it in. So into edit mode, I can select all and press F 
and that's a nice easy way to fill it in and you'll get a nice flat shape. There's no problem with that, it will work as long as it's a flat shape. If you want any curve to it, so actually the best way to do that, if I undo this fill, is to extrude and scale in our edges. Now just have a look what's happening. It's going towards my 3D cursor, so I need to change this back to the medium point, which is the default, undo that, extrude and scale in. Now depending on how much curve you want, you might want maybe a couple of these, so extrude and scale in, and then we want to grid fill the last bit. So I'll zoom in on that with full stop on my numpad. Now we can what's called grid fill this. And there's two ways to get to that tool. It's actually up in the face menu and there's grid fill, which works really nicely. But if for any reason you can't find these tools or you've forgotten where to find them, press F3 to search for your tools. And at least if you remember the name, you can type in grid and it will come up with grid fill. Now sometimes grid fill works, sometimes it doesn't. What it actually prefers is for you to select two sides of your polygon. So in other words, if I go to edge mode, it would be this one, this one, and this one, these four, and then these four over here. So two sides like that, and then it will grid fill for you. But this one worked without me doing that, which is always nice. Now, if you do want to add a curve, then we can press three to go to face mode, select this middle face and proportional edit. Now, if I grab and then press ZZ, that will be the local Z axis. Now remember, I didn't apply my rotation, so I'm able to go in that local Z axis because it knows that it's got some rotation applied to it already. So if I undo those steps and go back into object mode and I apply my rotation, so control A and apply the rotation. Now when I try to go in and press G, Z, Z, there isn't any change. The local axis is still up and it's not taking into account this rotation. So I'll undo those steps, and now I'm back to minus 10 for my rotation there, into edit mode, G, Z, and then Z again, you can see the Z axis changed. Now I can change that wheel of influence with my proportional edit, or well, I better turn it on again, G, Z, Z, and now I can get a nice curve. So that should give you enough information now to create this sort of steampunk pair of goggles with a few handy tips along the way. Let me know in the comments if you did anything differently. And remember, there's no right or wrong way. There may be a better way because it got you there quicker, but in the end, if the object looks good and it meets your requirements, then it was a successful way of doing it. Now, I haven't spent a particularly long time on the materials, but if you want to learn more about that, I will be introducing Node School soon. So look out for the playlist and I'll add it to the description of this if you're seeing this in the future. A Node School is where you can learn all about nodes and materials. So thanks for watching and I will see you next time.